foreign language and not in my usual car <coughs> fire delivery so that people could understand what I was actually saying. On the other hand, John has warned me he's going to cut my legs off in 30 minutes. So we'll get through this as fast as possible. And the, the, the basic message of this is going to be about uh, best practice management. The one thing in particular I want to talk about is people. And that's the quote from Emily Dickinson, one of my favourite quotes from the uh, Neven Certificate. And just basically, would you set sail without a plan of where, where you're going to? Believe it or not, that was me 30 years ago. I had there, it was red. Uh, Maura remembers, she was simple enough to see to me in Blackhawk. Um, ready to take on the world. Now, the world at that stage, uh, for me, was Cork, 1983. Uh, newly qualified, Fords had closed down, Dunlops had closed down, Verona Cork Dockyards had closed down, Cork was ready to close down, uh, we'd lost our real Taoiseach, uh, the Law Society only four years before had produced a report which is now gathering dust somewhere in Blackhawk, saying for God's sake we have 1400 solicitors, we never need another one of them, we just to cover off and do something else. Um, so that was the, the environment. My plan was head down, I was offered a job when I qualified, so I thought, great, I'll stick in there, get at least three years PQE uh, under my belt, and we'll see what the world was like after that. There was a small Bahama place in Bishopstown where I lived, uh, which subsequently bought over with the savings bank, and they destroyed it and turned it into a big bank premises. And my vague plan at the time was, you know, maybe in three years' time, I might be able to persuade said bank to give me a loan, buy the place, and set up a small kind of a, a suburban practice, which in 1983 was kind of a strange thing as well. Um, Henry Ford famously said, you know, if I, if I ask my customers what they want, they say, a faster horse. In other words, this is what a faster horse would look like. <laughs> but basically, the idea, you did what you, what you did before. And solicitors, lawyers, professions of all kinds, you know, uh, were necessary, even guaranteed income, it was very easy, you didn't have to advertise. In fact, professions didn't advertise, uh, which is why I'm interested in what John's comments about the advertising regulations. You know, solicitors <coughs> just would, you know, Live a long day uh, and it would get on well. Touch of Mary Hopkins in the, in the, in the old days. Um, but that was basically it. You can see a couple of references to Star Trek throughout this new realism Star Trek. Time. But it was live long and prosper. You know, you, you, once you qualified, that was it. You were guaranteed a living for life. Then. However, all this change changed differently. The new secret, even then, was to try and do things faster, cheaper, better. And that includes the new uh, CPD lectures like this faster, cheaper, and better. Um, so it involved looking at things in a new way. And in terms of new ways of looking at things, you've got to remember that people outside the legal profession sometimes think we're a very odd bunch. Uh, they don't realise that it's only the um, Justin McKenna's and the John Hussies of this world who go around all the time wearing the uh, And, and that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make them funny dummies. Uh, they're ahead of their time. They're only wearing the Dickiebos at some point, as John has again. But the idea is you've got to look at things differently. And why do we do things the way we do? We do things the way we do. And, you know, precedent builds up in terms of not just uh, legal precedent, but the way we do things. Because someone sometimes had to make a decision, what do I do? And then subsequently, they said, well, what did I do the last time? And then it becomes institutionalized. And we are creatures of habit. And we'll see references to Aristotle, and we'll see references to Stephen Covey coming up later, in terms of being creatures of habit. And sometimes habits are good, and sometimes habits are bad. Um, JFK, you're probably all familiar with this quote. At some point in your lives, you might come across it. Uh, you know, the about uh, asking, I need men to dream things that never were and ask why. You know, there's looking at things differently and saying, why can't we do this? Why can't we uh, do something different? And, you know, as lawyers, we have the reputation of being a bit conservative, and we are to a large extent. But there's no reason why we can't kind of try and think outside the box. If you look back, for example, at the 60s and the 50s, tax was a lawyer's area, not an accountant's area. No, it's an accountant's area, but that's because we lost it. There are other areas of work as well, where we're going to become challenged as a profession, and we've got to look and try to keep this under our belt, and to convince the world that we're going to be able to deliver it. Um, by the way, not that people know that that's actually delivered in the law. Uh, I, I read a lot. I don't sleep a lot. I read a lot. Uh, that's why I end up uh, writing books as well as reading them. Tomorrow's lawyer, Richard Suskind, UK solicitor, attorney, professor. And he's given up practice at the stage, he's into management consultancy. But he talks about tomorrow's lawyers and what things are going to be like. And he says the world is going to change in terms of the legal uh, profession because what we are selling is our expertise. We're selling a certain knowledge at times. But in the world where the internet now you can look up almost any bit of information, and where a lot of content is delivered for free and where people expect it for free, his basic premise is people are not going to pay you for what they can get for free. 
What they will want is the combination of all the bits of knowledge and to advise strategy. But the free stuff that goes into the development of the strategy, they won't necessarily pay for. And this is going to be valuable. Now, if you think back to it, just to put it in context about how technology uh, has changed legal practice over the last 30 years. When I qualified in 1983, the practice was Copley, Maloney, and Flynn, as it then was. John Copley, God rest him, was still using a kind of meditation device, device that looked a bit like that. There was a strip of plastic with a little bar on the end of it. He slotted this into a groove on a, a cylinder. He turned the cylinder and he switched it on. And he, when he switched it on in the morning, he said, Good morning, Mrs. Eagle. I'm commencing now. And we put it down. And he would leave it running throughout the day. And now this would last about an hour, at which stage he got up to the next one. But he might have been drafting for the hour and mightn't have uttered a word. And Mrs. Even had to dutifully wait throughout the hour. Um, but that would, literally it was something like that that he was dictating. That building or not was filed a picture of the, of the first fax machine filed in 1843. Uh, when I moved from Copa Maloney, the first practice in which I had a junior partnership role, I nearly caused the uh, named principal of the practice to have a heart attack because the guy would, rather than switch on the heat, the guy used to wrap a, a rope around his legs. Um, but I caused a heart attack the first week by ordering three electronic typewriters in 1986 at a cost of a thousand pounds each. And he had nearly had a heart attack. Uh, he couldn't see the concept of return on investment. Um, this is a shot of the, of the South Man in 1884. Now, at the far end of that is Barry C. Gallons, and on the far left of it, under the picture actually, is where Coco Maloney had their offices in 44 South Man. And that distance is important because they, you know, the, the legal world was the South Man in Cork, i.e., Gensler County. And this is a photograph of Joe Daly, who was one of two bookkeepers in Coco Maloney uh, at the time. I don't know how many they have now, but I don't know more than one. But you know, the, the way things were done, the Kalamazoo system, if you remember what that was called, uh, and you have to go to a certain vintage to remember using that. All paper days. But Joe was in her 70s, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and Eugene Glendon, who was the managing uh, person, the practice manager at the time, got a fax machine around 1981 82. And in fact, if you can remember back then, these things were big things. You know, they took up a lot of table by themselves. And he was trying to explain to Joe, who was in our 70s, the concept of a fax machine. And he explained, it's like a photocopy. And you feed a page in here, and you can send it, for example, to Galvin's at the other end of the map. And it'll come out there in the way it'll come out with a photocopy. And she said, how long will that take? And he said, well, it takes about 10 minutes. And she said, but should we know one of the other apprentices that have it delivered long before that? <laughs> so the idea that technology could be disruptive to cheap labor, which is the intention to draw the uh, God bless her. Um, you know, even if, I don't know if she was a fan of Star Trek, but if, even if she was a fan of Star Trek, and you try to explain to her that someday you can have a device that you can hold up in your hand, which is a data retrieval device, a dictation device, it'll transcribe it, it'll put it into an email and send it. You know, even William Shatner in the, in the 60s or 70s, I don't think, uh, even in Star Trek terms, they could have coped with the idea of all that, even if Roddenberry is credited with inventing the flip phone or the, the clamp phone. But, you know, they couldn't, I think, have imagined a, a world where something that happened to me last year, in the, I'm also a public, and in the faculty there was a big debate last year, you know, should we actually publish our mobile telephone numbers? And I was saying, yeah, up for that, been doing that for a long time. And some of the more conservative people were saying, you know, for God's sake, the idea that you pull over the side of the street and you take instructions in the back of the table is something so serious. You know, that was outrageous. And I was on the train, travelling from Dublin to Cork, uh, one Friday evening last year, uh, just after the West Cork um, fishing tragedy in which all the Egyptian sailors died. And I got a phone call from the registrar and he said, listen, there's a body being repatriated to Egypt in the morning, but they need a declaration and certificates completed by the embalmer and by the undertaker before the airline will accept the body for repatriation. Um, could you do it? Now, on the train, on the way to Cork, I got in the relevant information uh, using Wi-Fi uh, into my computer on the train, drafted everything up, got off the train, into a cab, down to O'Connor's, down to the in the car, in, and everything was printed out ready waiting for me. The declarations were taken, except for the seals were fixed, because I had the stuff with me and it goes with me very when I travel, and I was able to do all of that. Because of mobile phone, because of Wi-Fi, because of emails, etc. Uh, you know, something that would have been a <coughs> Uh, years ago. 
So you've got to be prepared to get out of this. And the thing about it is that sometimes we're, we're constantly promoting change. And we don't understand that change also equals opportunity. And we've got to look at it from that point of view. That things aren't necessarily a threat. People are getting the proverbials in a twist about what Andy Chatham is going to do in the uh, legal services uh, bill. And you know, how it might change things. Fine, it might change, but you have to adapt and you've got to get there. William Shakespeare, you know, there is a tie in the affairs of men, which when taken at the flood leads on to fortune. But omitted all the white that lies is bound the shadows and the miseries. Now, ignore the fact that this is uh, part of what Brutus said to Cassius, and we all know how to Brutus. Um, take the words to heart, however, right? Uh, the legal services regulation. Again, you know, people are seeing this as a, as a threat. Multidiscipline practices, well, is that going to be a threat? The idea that barristers are going to be going in house. They've already done it. John Breslin, senior counsel, joined the as a call for that summer. Um, that's going to happen regardless of whether the legislation allows it to come in and happen or not. And you've got to get used to it. And there are going to be threats, but equally there are going to be opportunities. Uh, William Gretzky, I'm by no means uh, an athlete, but he's famous for this uh, quotation. Skate where the pop's going, not where it's been. In other words, you've got to think ahead. Sometimes we are, to take the theme that what today is all about, so busy working in our practices that we don't think about working on them. We don't think about where we want to go or what we want to do. And if we stay that way, eventually we're going to run out of road. And you've got to think of things in, in, in new terms. So for example, um, having, I describe myself these days as a repentant lawyer, and having worshipped at the satanic altar of litigation for 25 years, converted to the one true church of mediation seven years ago. And I'm a great advocate of mediation, I'm a great believer in it. It's still slow coming, and the gatekeepers to what's going to happen are the lawyers. And the people we have to convince in terms of converting to the one true church of mediation are the lawyers. But when you think about what do clients want, they don't want five years of litigation. And if you can get a reputation through mediation of being a solutions provider in five weeks or five months, rather than a possible victory or a possible defeat in five years' time, then your practice will grow. Fine, you might not make the mega fees if you're trying to afford to pay, but you might get out of five years of litigation, but you can get a very handsome fee in five months. And because of that, you get more and more and more. And once you actually sign up uh, to that philosophy, it can work. You know, what to do? Do you follow the work? Do you follow what everybody else is doing? Do you follow the herald? Do you want to be one of the cows? Or do you do something unusual? So if you think about it, army deafness cases. Before army deafness cases existed, but people didn't know they existed. And trying to tell even the dear army people that they had a claim was like to be with, what? It, it took a, a bit of imagination to think about it. That here was potential for, again, generating business. And those who got in early on the army, army deafness uh, trail, so to speak, made good money out of it. Um, and one person was still driving around uh, their private work um, that they bought as well, the, the proceeds. Similar to clerical abuse claims, similar to the advertising C claims, uh, institutional abuse claims. And in compliance with the advertising regulations, people were able to advertise and say, look, you know, <coughs> government group solicitors are organizing a seminar, uh, an information seminar on bringing hepatitis C claims, uh, or whatever the, the claim is. And they got people in and they got people signed up. And they covered the market. They recognized an opportunity and they went out. Some would say they created it, but that's the way to go. When I set up my own practice 16 years ago, um, I decided to focus on an SME market and SME services. <coughs> you know, I come from a practice where uh, we were uh, three or four partners, <coughs> and at one point uh, in the early days, we decided we were going to get Apple Computers as a client. And I thought, yeah, yeah, fat chance getting multinational like that. And the practice did. But when I went to the one, I said to focus on the, 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 the legal level. And I tuned up, it was 86, the Commissioner for Roads, chartered, uh, became an arbitrator, a trademark agent, subsequently became a Republic. Uh, when I was in I never could generate much, when I became a Republic, uh, I met Pat Dorgan, uh, walking down the South Mountain, and he said, Is it true you've been appointed a notary? And I said, Jack, I said, My God, all of us do degrees and things, and she's been great when you get your first flight. And he walked out. Um, but again, you know, engaging with business groups, getting involved with Plato, getting involved with, with uh, other business support groups, um, getting involved in e-commerce when that was all the buzz. Uh, Deloitte and the Irish Examiner at one point were advertising a series of seminars around the country. And uh, one, one of these had already been won, but I ran into a man who was a partner in Deloitte uh, at the time, subsequently was president of the Chamber of Commerce, and I said, listen, I'm interested in 
uh, what somebody would have to say at these seminars about the e-commerce bill. Who's talking on the e-commerce bill? And there's kind of silence. I said, e-commerce bill. I said, yeah, e-commerce bill. What e-commerce bill? I said, you're not telling me that Deloitte's are running a seminar on e-commerce and you have nobody talking about the e-commerce bill. What e-commerce bill? He had no idea. And he said, oh, sorry, there is somebody. That'll be you. So I ended up speaking on it when I wanted to actually learn more about it. Um, but through that, I found the American Embassy, and they put me on a register. Now, not that kind of register, this was a business register. Uh, and I got business out of that. This in turn, uh, so the way I describe it is, I was trying to provide services all the way from incorporation, through operation, and on even to liquidation. Um, so in, as a result of that, I was actually, uh, I, got a, I still have that lamp, by the way. It's a lamp um, for being corporate business person of the month, let's say, for the year, for the year. Uh, Vodafone in 2004 featured me in an advertising campaign, and I got about 50 grand's worth of advertising over one weekend. Quarter page ads in all the business sections of all the newspapers. Can I point to a single client ever got out of it? No. So I'm skeptical about the value of advertising. So you need to worry, John. Uh, I'll get two million ads in for approval from me. Um, but you know, there was one person uh, did say to me, "You're not the cop show because you're that bored." Uh, <laughs> but that wasn't the uh, Again, the franchise association got involved with that in terms of uh, you know fostering business and uh, those things. And this anybody could have done it. Uh, but it's a question of you know what you want to do and what you want to get into. And I, as a result, I got an award for franchise person of the year in 2007, and the only non franchise industry person who ever did that. Equally, again, through uh, either, you know, one of my colleagues again described as a trend of marketing over substance. I got the, the Irish Law Award last year for a mediator arbitrator in the Sweet Susan for the year. And in one sense, it's true. You know, if you create the impression that you're brilliant and people believe it, do you have to be brilliant? <laughs> um, no, as I said, you know, I read a lot, but I, I write a lot. That's me. This is the first time I've ever put all of those together, believe it or not. Uh, there are all the things that I've included, the law society, the solvency menu. But I have a reputation, so to speak, in terms of being involved in liquidation. I'm like the undertaker, uh, or the person who advises the undertaker on how to undertake. Um, but outside of that, uh, there, there's a question of what to do next. And throughout my career, in the past 30 years, I've had cycles every few years doing something different. I started off as just an ordinary assistant doing the district court, the conveyancing mixed bag, conveyancing litigation, you know, district court defense work, road traffic, the whole lot. Then moved on uh, into a, another practice, got in a number of insurers, and I was doing defense insurance work on the kind of car claims, we never be back, so it was kind of the focus on litigation. Moved on from there, then into kind of de debt collection and debt recovery uh, and credit kind of enforcement. Moved on from that again uh, into others, and every few years I've had something new. And I actually love the challenge of doing something new. Derek and myself uh, were having a discussion some weeks ago. Um, Derek comes into our practice regularly to keep us all on our toes and make sure that we're performing. But uh, the question was asked, you know, what if we never get a judge? And there's kind of a, a look around the table, Jason, you know, you'd be all about it. Um, maybe we would be, or maybe other people would be. But Derek said, no, no, he didn't get bored. He couldn't sit still long enough to be a judge. Uh, but in, in terms of what I'd like to do next, is you know, I always thought I'd like to be the first High Court judge. Uh, and I was supposed to be invited to be the High Solicitor Judge, and like a peer people in that one. But you know, while I'm the first solicitor senior counsel, there's no reason why anybody in this room who knows their stuff couldn't argue a case in the Supreme Court. I went in front of the Supreme Court in February and I convinced three High Court judges to overturn the decision of a particular High Court president, the old name for fear of potential defamation, and uh, that a solicitor had not received a fair trial. And the law society would try to have struck off and uh, got that decision overturned. And we're you now going to go back again, seven years down the line, uh, for a retrial, but we've we got a retrial. Equally, I went in front of the Supreme Court. Again, this is a little bit of comparison, not to a blow down problem, because I knew my stuff. And I convinced three Supreme Court judges, Flaherty, Barron, and Murphy, that uh, a seat in a place of public entertainment or a theatre is not a structure on which you place your body weight in a sitting position throughout the performance. And just very quickly aside, there's a provision in 1927 the Toxic Game Liquor Act, somebody cannot be admitted to a theatre after half an hour at night unless they've previously paid for a seat for the performance in question. And it was a standing concert, and the proprietor got prosecuted for running a standing concert, not a seat concert. 
But I convinced the three judges of the Supreme Court that a seat is actually the airspace you occupy from the moment you went to the moment you leave. Now, that is so fascinating. But legally, there's a good sum of the foundation college. But anybody who knows their stuff, and don't tell me that the Richard Cannons in this world, or the John Hussey in this world, uh, or whoever doesn't know their stuff, sometimes you know it better than the, the barristers. Um, I, in 1991, I got a, a license for the point, get up, and they were 12 years that didn't get it. And they had a consultation with Thompson two weeks before, and one was uh, the guru on judicial review, and we were going from that to Alice to force the memory to issue the license. And the other, the junior, was an expert in licensing. But it was a fortnight before the and the client insisted on having the consultation a fortnight before the hearing. And of course, they hadn't really read the brief because they didn't need to read the brief. And you know, they, they kept getting things wrong, and I kept correcting them. And it came out, the client said, For God's sake, can you not do this yourself? It does do you just don't know what they're, what they're up to. And I said, Don't worry about it. They're experts at you know, sucking up a load of information at the top of their brief for the day. Sure enough, uh, when I came to in front of the Gagan, uh, James O'Reilly was asked when he was opening his textbooks, would you not like to? Quote your own book as an authority. Uh, and he said, Oh, I understand that you have to debt to be allowed to as an authority, bracket and after in court, right? And equally, he said, of, uh, Mr. Morgan uh, of counsel, you know, am I allowed to take traditional notice of Mr. Morgan's non expertise in licensing? And that was only turned to the client, well, no, told you. Um, but that's why you use people for their expertise. But if you have an expertise, uh, you, you should use it. Um, regularly, we get asked to advise other firms, a bit like counsel, so to speak, but we're doing that for other firms. But on to the, the, the whole thing about, you know, uh, where you're going in terms of medical practice. There are various things that you need to do, but the most important thing is going to talk about You know, you set standards and you manage them. There's no point in having a, yeah, yeah, we can do that, and not enforcing it. And what we do is we get Dermot in every few months to keep us on our toes. I came across Dermot years ago because Nick Carney was now coaching the Irish Rugby team, and his partner, Ed Murphy, and Snap Printing, but they did a bit of work for them. And they recommended that I get Dermot in. And Dermot actually transformed all this. But he introduced me to this, and it's this one book out of all the books that you should read. It's this book, Good to Great, by Jim Collins. And it's not about being the biggest. It's not about being, you know, a big five firm. It's about being the best that you can and delivering the best service. Um, again, strategic planning, plan your work, work your plan, fill the plan, and plan to fail. You've probably heard that all before. The marketing, you know, develop your strategy. What is it you want to be known for? And then you create the perception, and the perception of people's mind will become the reality. Uh, again, financial memory, section 68 letters, John has emphasized the importance of that. When you set up a practice, if you haven't already done so on your own, within two years, some of the law set will come knocking. And I set up Eddie Sheehan who I did. And he came to go through the final report, and they, you know, they go set the whole thing up before they send it off to Anna Harrington to, to read it. And he said there was something very suspicious here. And really, I was very uh, suspicious. Well, what, 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 what? And he said, you have absolute compliance with Section 68. And the Section 68 is setting up the fees that was from the times you were charge. Um, and he said, I was so suspicious, I stopped asking for files. I just went out and started going through the cabinets. This was when I had cabinets rather than trying to find And he said, you have to every single file. And I said, but you're supposed to have every single file. And he said, would you have to tell your colleagues that? Uh, he said, half the practices I go to, and this is 2000, he said, half the practices I go to, they don't have it at all, and the other half are going to hit and miss. And I said, it's the greatest godsend you could have, because if you're going to have a wrong with somebody about the things, you'll have it before you've done the work that you're not going to get paid for. Um, so I, I think it's great. The second thing is capturing all the time recorded. The third is billing all the time recorded, and the last one is recovery. And if you can do that, you're letting other things back. In HR management, and this is the most important thing, is Getting the right people on board, empowering people. Uh, as Roosevelt who said, the great executive is the man who recognizes the talent in the person, gets them on board to do a job, and then actually lets them get on board. And if you can recruit a team of people who are good, there's one particular lawyer that I, I know of, and who has walked these podia before with the law society, who is brilliant. He he's, would be a host celebrity in terms of uh, marketing. And his great secret is, he doesn't have to know any law. He has a team of lawyers who know the law and who can do things. His thing is getting people in. Uh, but he actually will freely admit to ask him, he knows sweet all over the law. So in terms of what you need, you've heard the expression probably as well, a fine or a minor, a wine or a grinder, a mix. And there's a bit of that in all of us. 
but you, you need this within a practice. You have to find someone who will bring in the clients. Then you have a single thing about the law that you bring them in. Their sales and market, they can get the clients in the door. Um, somebody else can take them from there. Mind the person who looks after them once they have them in the door and avoids the after sales service. You know, in our practice, for example, the prime example of that would be our manager partner, John Lane. He's not a steady job. Now, John hates the idea of giving a presentation like this. If he can pass up an opportunity, he will happily pass it up. Again, he says, you know, different strokes for different folks. He, he's not out there, but he's in there, uh, minding the shop. So he's actually at home working today while he's enjoying that strategy for the last seven years. The wine is someone who so can generate more business out of the existing clients. You want fries with that? Uh, you know, and we'll cross sell. We'll get the, uh, the wills done, the tax planning. James, you might look a bit dodgy. You need the old power attorney there in place before you, you, you fall off, etc. Um, the grind then is the homicide. So I was going to say the homicide lengthy social sociopath with collection account. We keep in the back room, but you've never actually got to talk to the client. Anybody recognizing some people in their own practice in this um, But you need, you need all of that. You need the low cost who's actually willing to stay away for hours, but really isn't that interested in people. They're not, they don't do people, they're not making a people person. And then you've got to manage all that. Uh, so you really only need to take time out to actually review what you're doing. You know, are you are like the lemmings heading for the cliff, or are you heading somewhere else? So analyze it, critique it, decide what you're going to do. Like for example, a couple of years ago we took on a Polish law. We thought, Jesus, we're going to capture the Polish market. 270,000 poles uh, might lead to the expectation clients. You know, we're going to take this on board and we're going to take the whole thing over. Hope that for game of it's After two years, we realized we didn't understand what was going on in Polish. Uh, and, and we did a risk analysis in terms of the cost benefit. What was that to get? Managing information systems, again, use the best of technology. You've got to hear about technology tomorrow from you and what you're going to work with that. But I use voice recognition and document reproduction. That's a picture of me at my desk. I had a client in recently, an accountant, and he said it was the strangest lawyer's office he'd ever been into. Because every other office, I don't know where he was going before he came to me. But every other office he had gone to, he said there were dirty great big points, files, and put on the walls. And he couldn't see a single file inside my office. Um, again, but all of this is to try and deliver good quality uh, services. And you have to commitment to the client, integrity, confidence, fees, etc. And you in, inculcate an idea that the clients are getting good value for their money. Um, and creating client value. If you're a Western management consultant in the UK, who's one of a, a network, uh, and who's published extensively on this, she says, it's the clients who dictate what constitutes good value. Not what you think is good value, it's what they think. Back to what Derek was talking about, what does the other person uh, receive? And the values change. But you, you, you can create standards, you can set standards, you can set expectations, you can tell people what you're going to deliver, and then you deliver. And you say, Jesus, they're great. Um, you know, what, what do the clients expect when they encounter a lawyer? One time there was a client hanging away, and I said, look, look, and I'll see you again. And he said, Jesus, look, do you not be annoyed? The only place I ever want to see you again is over the head of the point. He said, people only come to you when they're in trouble. You're a grudge purchase. People do not want you know, as their mission in life to come up to lawyers, or they're really sad people. Um, and it taught me a lesson in terms of trying to uh, take the monkeys off of me. If you only have a said, you have to have a clear client service from start to finish. And ask the client when you're finished, you know, did we give you high time communications? Did we deliver on time? What's what we said to you clear and unequivocal? Uh, you know, as lawyers, we're famous for complicating things. And a simple example, uh, how would a lawyer translate this question? One doctor is talking to another doctor, which doctor decides the treatment plan? A lawyer, believe it or not, is capable of turning that into it. The doctor is talking to another doctor. Those doctors are doing their own. Doctor, doctor, he's doctor, remember, he's the doctor, he's the doctor, he's the doctor. The needle tells you, paragraph B. Does the doctor mean doctor? That's the doctor's doctor, he's the doctor, he's the doctor, he's the doctor. There's nothing so simple a lawyer can't do. Again, are you priced competitively upfront? 